Hello and welcome. Wherever you are in the world today, thank you for joining us for the Rise Traveler, unpacking conversations of sustainable travel. We are here to talk to eco-minded and socially conscious travelers, diversity and inclusion specialists, wildlife conservationists, environmental activists, and anyone using travel as a way to uplift and inspire. Together, we will go a step beyond the Instagram-ready world of travel and take a look at how travel can be a source of growth and development for all people in all communities. And now, here's your host, Amy Hager. So joining me remotely today is Katerina with Explore Equity. Thank you so much for being on today's show. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So I want to start off by making sure that our listeners and even myself understands what's your connection with the RISE Travel Institute? How are you involved? I met the founder, Vinci Ho, a few years ago in New York City at a conference. And our connection was really through the Impact Travel Alliance because she had been a chapter leader. And so I was introduced to her by the founder of ITA, Kelly Louise. And we had a lovely conversation and I just had a great memory of meeting Vinci that day. We stayed connected over the years. And as Explore Equity launched an online store, our online store. So we're currently a partner of her there. So as we just stayed connected, there was a natural link between what we're doing with Explore Equity since we focus on social justice mm-hmm. and the Rise Travel Institute. So our connection is just beginning as the story of Rise Travel Institute is also um, up and coming. Yeah, so then um, the one piece that we missed that I think the internet cut out. So you have a online store, is that what you were saying? Yes. Okay. And well, what's in that store? What we have in the store now is the Paths Crossing game. We also have virtual experiences and other products that support local communities around the world. So the products that, in addition to Paths Crossing, what we have is a virtual cooking class with a chef in Mexico City. Oh, wow. It's amazing. So delicious. All these different salsas. And I love it um, because she chose different techniques that I think most people are not aware of in terms of making salsa, like roasting and different techniques there. Wow. And we also have a book. We have a book from Brazil that Mm -hmm. is called Travel to Brazil, the cookbook, and it features recipes and stories from all across the country. So that's really unique that you can... I guess, go to your store and be able to experience um, things from all over the world, but at your home right now, especially during this time of the pandemic and some places still being shut down with travel, others maybe not as much. So what a beautiful experience and thing for people to go through. And we'll put the link um, in the chat in the comments here in Facebook. So that way anybody can explore it. Or if you're checking this out on YouTube or our podcast, we'll put it in the description. So I wanna turn to you though. Um, Vinci tells me that you are a fierce advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in workspace and in travel, and especially with reference to disability. So tell us, how did you get started? Um, what inspired you to really start down this career path? Let me know if the internet comes out at any point and I can back up. But so I'm Katarina Rivera and I'm Latina and this identity is very important to me. I'm also disabled and I've been disabled my whole life. I have a condition called Usher syndrome, which Mm -hmm. means that from birth, I experienced hearing loss and I've been wearing hearing aids since I was very young. At 17 years old, I found out that I was having... um, progressive vision loss as well and received the diagnosis of Usher syndrome. So right before I went off to college, my life completely changed and I really had already adapted so well to my hearing aids. Oh, you're froze. 
people helping me because now I was off on my own. So it's been a journey for me personally, as far as accepting my disability. I have, you know, it's been a, almost 20 years as far as past the diagnosis. So mm -hmm. I feel like um, because I've been on that journey myself, I've been in denial, I finally accepted and started to get services and help and deal with the impact that blindness had on my life. for what I needed. Um, being on that journey gave me so much power. And mm -hmm. so now I felt like public advocacy was right for me. I have the capacity for it and I have so much to offer other people. But my audience is not really about um, other disabled individuals. Although I do speak to them. My audience is the people that don't know anything about disability, the workplaces that are not prioritizing disability as part of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, because unfortunately it often gets left out. So mm -hmm. I started my business as this public speaking and consulting to work with companies to change their workplaces to be more inclusive, more aware of disability. So the topics that I come in and offer training on focus on things like ableism, disability awareness, how to avoid microaggressions, and just kind of where my passion began and I'm seeing great feedback. It's also important for me to represent as a disabled Latina, we don't see a lot of people who mm -hmm. are out there and being featured and like as the face of disability, we don't see a lot of Latinas there. So it's important to me to talk about intersectionality as well. Hmm. So then um, throughout your life, how has your disability impacted your travel experiences? I love travel. I just love travel. I think it's one of the most amazing ways to grow as a person and to learn about the world. And it's also, oh, you're back. hold on. Can you start? Can you start over? You froze. All I heard was, I love travel. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'll start over. Yes. Oh, I love travel. Travel is so transformative and it's really beautiful way to connect with people around the world and just grow as a person. So um, I've been traveling for a long time. Since my disability is progressive, my needs have changed as I have continued to travel. Mm -hmm. I think that um, like any person with a disability, there are stress and nerves that are associated with travel. For example, when I'm flying, sometimes I just don't know what's going on because the announcements on the plane are very muffled. It's yeah. very uh, under hard to understand that voice and there's no captioning or text-based announcement that happened so I remember that I was on a flight that was making an emergency landing and then we actually had to stay overnight in Iceland and wow themselves and there was no clear instructions or like attention provided to me as a disabled person. There was nobody there to assist me. So I felt like very isolated and that is really challenging. Other challenges that I've experienced are because of my blindness, navigating new areas can be stressful. And so even though I love having the experience of travel, I have to kind of sometimes work my way up to that energy level of saying, okay, I'm going to leave the hotel room now and I'm going to get out there and do it because it can feel overwhelming. So sometimes I've been, I remember a trip in Hong Kong. I was sometimes in the hotel room until 2 p.m., just like not yet ready to go mm -hmm. out and expend that effort. But I always did it in the end. Um, so... And right now, this is not my experience, but wheelchair users are speaking out 
about airlines damaging their wheelchairs. And this is a really serious issue. There is, I'm sure it's been going on for a long time. It clearly has not been solved. And these wheelchairs are incredibly expensive. They're power wheelchairs. People absolutely need them for independence. And so this is just an example of the inequity and the lack of attention or importance play, uh, placed upon disability issues. So mm -hmm. for, me, for me specifically, I've also seen by using the White King, which I do use now, okay. sometimes it, it actually builds connections with people. Oh. I was, uh, yeah, sometimes people um, just approach me because of it, or you know, they want to know if I need help, or if I was on a hike one time, also in Hong Kong, but I did by myself and I wow. didn't know which way to go. And I saw a couple with a dog and I just asked them and they actually invited me to do the rest of the hike with them. So I fun. had a great time. It was super fun. It was much easier to kind of follow them. Mm -hmm. You make a connection, you hang out and then you part ways. So that was a beautiful memory. I love that. So I want to ask an, uh, a personal question, if you don't mind, is, is it appropriate to come? Do you feel comfortable for someone to come up and ask you, hey, can I help you out? Do you need anything? Like as it's, a fellow traveler? It's totally appropriate. You can ask people in the guise under the guise of helping they touch people or they touch their mobility aids and touching somebody's wheelchair or white cane is like you're touching their body it's their personal space. hold on you just came back the internet cut out again we're gonna get through this my friend so um do you mind starting over is it okay like as a fellow traveler and i just want to make sure that our audience hears the question is it okay as a fellow traveler to approach you and ask if you need help or assistance? Yes, you can approach someone and ask them if they need help. However, don't touch them. Don't touch their wheelchair or mobility aid because that's like you're touching their body, like you're invading their personal space. So the other thing that's important is if someone says no, they don't need help, you have to respect the no. Sometimes people are very nervous for me when I'm using a white cane, like for example, a puddle is coming up, I do have usable vision because that's something people don't understand about blindness. You can use a white cane and still have usable vision and that's valid. Like I'm still in need of the white cane. I'm not faking. Testing. There you are. Okay. Back. So when you're using the white cane, you're it's totally valid. You're not faking, and then that's where you dropped off. Okay. Yeah, I'm not faking. So sometimes um, people feel like I'm not going to see something that is in front of me, and so but they ask me if I need help, and I if I say no, then I don't need help. That. So that's it. <laughs> well, um, so then. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, inclusivity in the travel space. What, what would you want or what do you want um, the travel industry to know about disability and what, you know, what can the travel industry do better? Yeah, the travel industry can definitely improve training. accessible. So the travel industry can improve training because a lot of activities are not accessible okay. and providers are also not always empathetic in terms of dealing with disability. So I remember I was in Baños, Ecuador, and we were doing a canyoning experience. And I went to providers. I asked him, can I go canyoning? This is my disability. The guy in the office said, yes, you're going to be fine. We're going to put you on this specific waterfall and you're going to be fine. And that on the actual day, the guide that I was paired up with 
was not very nice. He just mm -hmm. wasn't. And so I felt uncomfortable and even asking questions sometimes. So we really need as a disabled person, someone who's going to be communicative, a good listener, empathetic, who's willing to work with us and wants to include us. And these are basic things, but I think out there, we don't see enough of that. And we also see people, um, for example, designing spaces that are not truly accessible. Like hmm. I saw on Instagram, an accessible hotel room where it, Uh, people need to design with disabled individuals. They need to design proper, <laughs> yeah. properly and not come up with their own idea of what's going to be acceptable. So I just think the travel industry has a long way to go. Yeah. And there's also um, a lack of understanding, I think, of the spending power of people with disabilities. Like we are 25% of adults in the United States are disabled. So Hmm. When you think about who has a disability and what's the spending power of the group, it's it's a lot of people. It's, so yeah, a large portion, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. So then, talking a little bit more about your business, you're the founder of a sustainable travel business. Tell us the the values behind your business and really how you support local communities. Sorry, I thought we were leaving that question for next time. Oh, well, we are leaving that question for next time. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I do want, can you give us a quick little highlight of what the business is? So that way, at least today's listeners can get a little peek and know that we're coming back in a few weeks with more. Sure, sure. Okay, so Expo Equity is a sustainable travel business that supports local communities while connecting travelers to real social justice issues. In the past, we offered group travel experiences, and now we've moved to the online store model. And mm -hmm. on our Instagram and our online presence, we talk a lot about issues and themes like decolonization, the um, things like travel, um, tourism leakage, the impact of your travel, and just how you can make better decisions that support mm -hmm. communities around the world. So it's very important to us to raise awareness as well as create experiences that are new for travelers and really a lot more unique than what you might find in a travel guide. I get that. And so then, this kind of actually is helpful as I'm leading into this next question that I want to ask you, which is when you look to the future, like in an ideal world, what do you see as the future of the travel industry? And really specifically for this interview today, how DE&I is informing our future? Well, if we're talking about the ideal world, we will see a travel industry where inclusion and accessibility matters and is thought of from the beginning in any process and just everything. I also want to see that when we look at travel around the world, we see disabled people in jobs, in tourism jobs. Mm. And the other thing that is really important is to have local communities that are truly supported by travel rather than travel taking away resources from them and that we see protection of the natural environment being done at the highest level. The protection of people, place and planet mm -hmm. is super important. And I would like to see travel that is just more in the colonization remain. I'd like to see a travel you that is more- You just came back. You would like to see a travel that is, and then you went blank. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, travel that is equitable. I'd like to see travel that is equitable on both sides and where we don't see the 
remnants of colonization remaining where the traveler has a lot of power mm. over a destination and the idea is historically have seen and it's been very damaging. So this, I'm really excited to ask you this last question. Um, Katerina, what legacy do you wanna leave behind in this world? I've enjoyed our conversation so much and have learned so much from you. I'm just curious. Yeah, well, I would love to leave a big legacy for sure where, um, people have gotten the message that disability is just a part of the world's diversity. It's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. And that we see in terms of my impact, I'd love to know that I created allies, that I truly created and educated a bunch of allies and decision makers at companies, people who are just following me on Instagram and become allies in their personal lives, whatever these allies is exist. I just want to know that I've created them and had that kind of impact. And I always want to be living a purposeful life yeah. and leave people feeling like just a sense of connection to me and my message. Mm -hmm. mm. That's so beautiful. And I'm so true. I think you're, you're tooting that horn right now. Um, that's so mm -hmm. awesome. We're at the end of our time today, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I know we've had some internet glitches, but you know what? We got through it. I love it. So thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Um, I hope that people can connect with me after the interview at my website, katarinarivera.com. I'm on Instagram and Clubhouse as Blindish Latina. Ooh. And I also am on LinkedIn. I love it. And we'll go ahead and come back and put those links in the comments because it is so important for these interviews for you to be able to connect audience to the person that I'm interviewing. So thank you so much for offering all of those different ways to connect. That's awesome. Um, but that does bring us to the end of our journey today. And if you've liked what you've heard and you want to hear more, please subscribe to our email list at risetravelinstitute.org slash subscribe. And thank you again, Katerina, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. It was a pleasure. So we will be back soon with another episode. But until then, keep roaming, keep learning, and continue to be a RISE traveler. Bye-bye. This podcast is an extension of the RISE Travel Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit committed to empowering young travelers through educational programs, research, study tours, and scholarships. Visit risetravelinstitute.org to learn more.